Amen. Turn to Revelation chapter 9. So there was a man who got into a taxi cab, and during the course of his ride, he wanted to ask the taxi driver a question. And so they had the little sliding door between the back seat and the driver, and so he slides it open, and he reaches out, and he taps the taxi driver on his shoulder, and all of a sudden, the taxi driver is just freaked out, and he starts swerving all over the place. He barely misses a couple of cars, runs on the curb, almost hits a pedestrian, and comes to a quick stop. And both men are just shaking up. They're just both freaking out. And the passenger's saying, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to scare you like that. And the driver says, oh, no, no, it's not your fault. You know, this is my first day as a taxi driver. For the last 20 years, I drove a hearse. (laughs) So, you know that we're living in a time when people are a little jumpy, <laughs> we're living in a time when it's a little fearful. Uh, things of this world are certainly uncertain, and whether it's you know crime rate going up or the stock market going down, whether it's you know human trafficking, illegal drug use going up, or the likelihood of Russia and her neighbors coming down into Israel. Uh, Whatever else is on your mind, that pales in comparison to Revelation chapter 9. When you look at, you know, throughout Scripture, there's no greater contrast than that of God's grace and mercy, and the other opposite is His wrath and judgment. And it's found throughout the Bible, where we see God's love being poured out upon sinful creatures like us, But for all those who reject God's love and grace, they will eventually face God's judgment. They will face God's wrath. They will face these things from the Lord because they've rebelled and sinned against God. Uh, We see this contrast in verses like this, John 3, 36, which says, He who believes in the Son, in Jesus, has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So that's as extreme as you can get. If you believe in him, eternal life. Reject him, eternal damnation. Jesus says it like this in John 5, 24. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but is passed from death into life. In other words, every person, because we are born sinners, we have this cloud of condemnation hanging over our heads. But the moment you come to Jesus for salvation, he removes that cloud of condemnation and he fills you with his Holy Spirit. And like Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so for all of us who've believed in him, who have received Jesus into our lives by faith, we have nothing to fear. After all, Jesus has given us eternal life. He's promised he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He's with us always. He's preparing a place for us in glory. But for those who continue to reject Jesus, they reject the free gift of salvation that he bought and paid for through the shedding of his blood, that he poured out on the cross. If you die without Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will bear the responsibility for your own sin. And unfortunately, that leads to the lake of fire. These are not my opinions. This is just what the Word of God says. But as we've seen over and over again, God does love you. He does not want to see people perish and die because of their sin. The whole reason we celebrate Christmas is Jesus came from heaven to earth. He took on a human body. Yes, he was laid in the manger as a baby. But that's not the end of the story, even though this time of year everybody wants to focus on the cute little Jesus. He is also the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's why he came, was to suffer and die. During the Great Tribulation, he becomes Lambo. Remember, chapter 6, at the end of chapter 6 of Revelation, they know this is the wrath of God from the Lamb. So Lamb and wrath don't necessarily mix, but Jesus is coming back at His second coming as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. 
So you either receive him and receive forgiveness or reject him and you will face judgment. Now, God always has a witness. We've seen this throughout the book of Revelation, chapter 7. We saw Jesus uh, seals seven or uh, 12,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes. So 144,000 Jewish people are given the seal of God upon their foreheads. They are indestructible. They're like the Apostle Paul, 144,000 of them, running all over the planet, preaching the gospel, telling people about Jesus. So God has a witness. We'll see there's two witnesses in chapter 11, probably Moses, for sure, Elijah, and they'll be warning the people about what's happening. And then God sends his angel in chapter 14, verse 6. He has the everlasting gospel. He proclaims, you know, tells people, repent. Re don't receive the mark of the beast. Turn to Jesus before it's too late. He gives them the gospel. So God always has a witness. Now, we saw last week in chapter 8, the first four trumpets... Remember, Jesus takes the scroll, has seven seals. Every time he opens a seal, a judgment comes out. The seven, seven seal is not the end. It brings forth seven trumpet judgments. We saw the first four last week in chapter 8. And then at the end of chapter 8, we see this angel flies through the midst of heaven saying, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. So four judgments have come. Three more, even more severe, are coming. We're going to look at two of those in chapter 9. Happy, happy, joy, joy. Merry Christmas to all. <laughs> and to all, a good night. No, this is going to be brutal beyond our comprehension. Again, what we're going to look at are things that have never happened in the world, I mean, we don't have a reference point as we go through these things to say, oh yeah, this is exactly what's happening here. But we know that God's word is sure, is going to happen as God says. John's going to try to describe to us these amazing things. Chapter 9 has been the catalyst for much of what, you know, you read about, you know, with science fiction novels and they turn them into movies and TV programs, The Walking Dead and all that kind of stuff. It comes out of chapter 9. We, we see crazy things here when the fifth and sixth trumpets are blown. So, literally, hell breaks loose on planet Earth during this time. Chapter 9, verse 1. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him, personal pronoun, he's going to identify as him. <laughs> I'm sorry. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Now, this star is very different from previous stars we've already saw. In chapter 1, Jesus is holding seven stars in his hand, and we saw those were the seven messengers, probably pastors, of the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. And then in chapter 6, we saw stars hitting planet Earth. The Greek word there is aster, like asteroids, meteorites. This is different. This is a star that Jesus or John watches fall to earth, but he says it in the past tense, has fallen to earth. So this has already happened. And this has a, a name, as we'll see here in a moment. This star has a personality. It says, to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So this has already happened. Um, when Jesus sends out the disciples two by two and they come back and they're all excited, you know, even the demons had to, you know, obey your voice and things we said in your name. And then in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus responds and he said to them, Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now remember Satan was kicked out of heaven. He was known as Lucifer. He was one of the amazing angels. He was a cherubim that God had created, one of the archangels. As Lucifer, he was in charge of worship around the throne of God, and then pride enters into his heart somehow, and he was not satisfied with his role that God created him for. And so this is what we read about his downfall in Isaiah 14, starting in verse 12. This is what we read about Satan's rebellion. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, 
And this is known as the five I wills of Satan, of Lucifer. This is what he says in his heart. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And that is known as the lie of Satan. Um, he spoke the lie to Adam and Eve saying, you won't die when you eat this forbidden fruit. You will be like God. And that lie has been permeated throughout the world. People think they can become a God. They think they don't need Jesus for salvation. I can save myself. I am a God. I've got this human potential within me, this divine spark and all this other nonsense. There's only one true God. That's Jesus Christ. You, you will not become a God. Only Jesus is God. And for anybody to say, I will become like God, that's the lie of Satan. Uh, Paul says this is the lie, that people believe this lie rather than the truth of God in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So God responds saying, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. So ever since Satan got booted out of heaven, he has done all that he can in order to steal, kill, and destroy God's special creation, the human race. That has been his goal, his objective. The Bible has recorded many of Satan's schemes to come against mankind, starting with Adam and Eve, when he got them to eat the forbidden fruit. Um, chapter 9 here is one of his worst attacks ever, as we'll see that uh, he'll destroy a third of all mankind, just with one of these judgments here in a moment that we'll look at. Paul talks about the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit, that's the restrainer mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2. It says when the restrainer is removed, then the Antichrist is revealed. So the restrainer is the Holy Spirit working through us, his church. We're the, we're the light, we're the salt. But once the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, then literally all hell will break loose when the Antichrist comes on the scene. Now, we saw it back in chapter 1, verse 18. Jesus held the keys to Hades and death. So apparently, Jesus gives Satan a key that unlocks a certain room within Hades, and it's called here, notice, the bottomless pit. It's also known as the shaft of the abyss. The Greek word for bottomless pit or abyss is abusos, and that's what it literally means, the, the shaft of the abyss. This is the place where extremely wicked and vile demons have been locked up. You think demons are bad. There are classifications of demons, and these are some of the worst that have been locked up for, I don't know, many, many millennium. They've been locked away. Now, we know that most demons follow Satan's lead. They're looking for ways to steal, kill, destroy. They, they want to lie. They bring in confusion. But as followers of Jesus Christ, we, you and I, were protected from the onslaught of Satan. You and I have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You and I have been given the armor of God. Paul's very clear about this in Ephesians chapter 6. Look at these verses on the screen, verse, uh, starting in verse 11, Ephesians 6, 11, Put on the whole armor of God, this is for your spiritual protection, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Remember, wild E. Coyote, the roadrunner, you know, and the coyote, that's where they get the name from, the wiles of the devil. That's why he's called wild E. Coyote. Me, me, you know, so... Roadrunner was able to escape him. That's where it comes from. Literally, that's where it comes from, the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. These are rankings of demons. Against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand... And then Paul lists all these various components of the armor of God. We're put on the helmet of salvation. It protects our mind from the lies of the enemy. We, we put on the breastplate of righteousness. We walk in truth. 
We have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We have the, you know, the shield of faith that extinguishes all the flaming darts of the evil one. We have uh, the, the, the word of God, you know, that sword. We are told that we can um, have wisdom when the enemy attacks because we're in prayer. And we're to be praying and seeking God's will for our lives. Don't ever forget what 1 John 4, 4 tells us. It's a gr glorious promise where the Apostle John, who wrote Revelation, he says, you are of God, little children. So if you're born again, you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. This applies to you. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Speaking of the Antichrist and his demons, because he who is in you is greater than, so Jesus in you is greater than he, that's Satan, who is in the world. And so the bottom line is we are safe and secure in Christ. But at this time, during the Great Tribulation, everything is very, very chaotic. Look at verse 2. And he, this fallen star, he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Now, when he opens this pit, it erupts like a giant volcano, and it just pours out all this smoke, and we're going to see all these demon critters are going to come flying out of here, but it darkens the sky. So even though this is a supernatural spiritual event, it you know, flows over, falls into the material world as well. The natural world is affected by spiritual warfare. Don't ever think that, oh yeah, demons are over here doing their thing with God's angels and I don't have to worry about anything. It'll spill out. I mean, you see so many things in the world today, all the crime, sexual immorality, all these things, it's all demons behind it and it you know, affects those in this world. So it will always reveal itself at some point. Again, these are not your everyday run-of-the-mill demons that are coming out. These bad boys have been locked away for a very long time. The word bottomless pit is used seven times in the book of Revelation. If you remember when Jesus cast the, the legion of demons out of that demon-possessed man in Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 30, he crosses the Sea of Galilee, and there's a cliff there, and there's the Gadarene, and he was cutting himself and just crazy. And this is what we read about this. Jesus asked him, saying, what is your name? And he said, Legion. I don't know how he said it, but, you know, many, because many demons had entered him. So a lot of demons in this guy. But notice, and they begged him, begged Jesus, that they would, or that he would not command them to go out into, notice the abyss. It's the same word, abusos, the bottomless pit. So Jesus did not cast him into the abyss. He cast him into that herd of swine, remember that was there? It says that 2,000 demon-possessed pigs run off this cliff. There's only one place in the Sea of Galilee where there's a steep embankment, and they drown in the Sea of Galilee. And that was the first case of? Deviled ham. There you go. <laughs> okay, you got to find, you know, where you can find humor in this chapter, you got to dig it out. So, that's what happened with the demons. Jesus said, okay, I'm not going to let you, or I'm not going to put you in this abusos, a bottomless pit. And so, those demons that possess those pigs, they're still doing their thing all over the world today, along with a lot of other demons. But don't forget, God's holy angels outnumber the demons two to one. We get that from chapter 12, and we'll, we'll see that later on. Anyway... Check this out in Jude verse 6. This is where we see that certain demons went beyond boundaries that God established for demons. I don't know how they do that, but Jude 6 says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he is reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And we'll see here with these two trumpet judgments, this is the great day where these demons are let loose to torment the people on planet Earth. 
2 Peter 2 verse 4 says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So these particular angels, they've been locked away, but during this time in the Great Tribulation, they are let loose. So look at verse 3. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. So they're locust, scorpion-like critters. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So take note of that. These are not your average locusts that have plagued the earth for a thousand years. These are some weird mutant kind of a locust where they have stingers like scorpions. These demons, you know, well, not these, but demons don't have physical bodies. But demons, as we know, can inhabit physical bodies. Demons spiritually can go into, like Satan in the garden. He went into the serpent, the shining one, the the snake. We often picture that. And he was talking through the snake. Demons go into the pigs. You know, demon-possessed people, they're all over the world. Jesus cast many demons out of people so they can inhabit, you know, human beings and animals. So these demons appear as locusts who have the sting of a scorpion. Um, Locust natural vegetation, that's their diet. They eat anything green. We saw last week all the green grasses, all the herbage was burned up. A third of all the trees were burned up. Here they're going to be told not to harm the grass or the trees. The remaining trees, grass grows back rather quickly, but they're not to eat any of that. Their whole purpose, as we see here, is they attack people. Everybody on planet Earth during the Great Tribulation will be attacked by these demons. The only ones that won't be are the 144,000 Jews. The 12,000, it says, you know, very clearly here, the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Who has that? Well, we saw in chapter 7, that's 144,000. The seal of God, God's name, was put upon them, and they're the only ones not protected. This means you and I, we're not going to be here because we're protected by the Holy Spirit. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1 Verse 13 says, In him, in Jesus, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. So you trusted Jesus after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So that's, that's your responsibility. you got to believe. God did everything for your salvation, but you have to believe. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is a guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And so a genuine follower of Jesus Christ cannot be demon-possessed. Yes, you can be hassled. Yes, you can be tempted. Yes, you can become discouraged and depressed if you give in to the lies of the enemy, but you cannot be possessed by the devil, by a demon. And no time can the demons break the seal of God that the Holy Spirit has placed upon you. Remember, I talked about this earlier. um, And then in chapter 20, Satan is put into the abyss, this bottomless pit. A seal is placed on him, and he is locked away for 1,000 years, the millennial reign of Christ. He can't break that seal and get out. He can't break the seal of the Holy Spirit and get in you. So make sure you understand that so you don't get tossed to and fro by every weird thing out there. These demon and these demonic creatures that we're looking at, these are some of the worst of the worst when it comes to ranks of demons, but they cannot harm the 144,000 at this time or any time. Now check this out in verse 5. And they were not given authority to kill them, talking about everybody else on planet Earth, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. 
A couple of interesting things to take note of here. First of all, we see God puts limitations upon these demon critters. They're not allowed to kill anybody, which is good news for these people, but bad news in the sense that they're going to be tormented for five months, 150 days. It says their sting is like a scorpion. Now, there's hundreds of varieties of scorpions in the world. Some, if you got stung, it's like a little bee sting. Sometimes it doesn't even affect anybody. Some can be a little bit more painful. Some can be extremely painful where you're just on the ground, you know, writhing in pain. Some could actually kill you, like snakes, different types of venom and so forth. Some varieties are just very, very deadly. But these demons that take on the appearance of locusts, again, they sting and torment people for five months, 150 days. Now remember what I just read in Jude verse 6, that these demons were locked away in darkness because they did not keep their own abode. They did not stay within the boundaries that God established for them. It's very possible... I can't be totally dogmatic on this, but it's very possible that these demons are the same demons mentioned in Genesis chapter 6. And when we read about just before the flood, when God was about to destroy every human being on, on this planet with the flood, uh, we read a very disturbing account of what happened where I believe they were demons somehow impregnated women and they brought in these giants known as Nephilim. I know some commentators say, well, no, the sons of God are just these uh, descendants of, you know, Seth. And they took in these evil women and they had these weird kids that were, you know, rebellious. I don't see that. I mean, take note of this in Genesis 6, starting in verse 3. The Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. In other words, when he says this, they got 120 years before the flood. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. The phrase sons of God, I think it's four or five times in the book of Job, the sons of God always refers to demons. Now demons can possess bodies. What they can do with those bodies, I don't know. But I think something weird happened and it altered the DNA of the people that were being impregnated. And all of a sudden, the whole world is going to be destroyed by God because they were not truly human. There's a phrase out today known as transhumanism. Nothing to do with transgender. Transhumanism means that you take out someone's DNA, you replace it with this other altered DNA, and we'll get into that here in a moment. It's weird stuff. But be that as it may, it says, They bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Remember, Jesus says the last days will be just like the days of Noah. Weird things are going to happen. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The rest of chapter 6 of Genesis, you see Noah and his three sons building the ark. Then the Lord brings all the animals onto the ark. Just Noah and his family are saved. God breaks up the waters of the deep, it says, under the earth's crust, comes up. This vapor canopy around the earth at that time comes down. And it says that the waters were upon the earth for 150 days, five months, Genesis 7:24. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. It's quite possible that these same demons who have been locked up in the abyss, the bottomless pit, were also responsible for turning God's people against mankind. And these demons did these weird things back in Genesis. And now they've been locked away. And just as the waters flooded the earth for 150 days, this trumpet judgment it lasts for 150 days. It's also interesting that more and more 
uh, prophecy experts are seeing a correlation between the destruction of mankind during Noah's day and, and what's going to happen during the Great Tribulation. The correlation being that the mark of the beast could be associated with changing the DNA of those who receive it. So some of you are familiar with the World Economic Forum. It's led by Klaus Schwab. His right-hand man is this um, Israeli guy named Yuval Harari. And he's not a believing Jew by any means. And, you know, Bill Gates is part of this. Joe Biden has been part of this. Al Gore has been part. I mean, there's a list of hundreds and hundreds of people that they are all wanting to see the Great Reset. You'll hear that phrase used. And Harari, you can go online and look at some of his the things he says. It is wild. He says, Jesus is a myth. And when we get to Revelation 13, they're blaspheming Jesus. They're blaspheming God, and they're going to try to make their own God, and they're going to say, you can become a God. Well, Harari is saying, Jesus is a myth. It's all a lie. We are going to have eternal life by becoming transhuman. This is what he talks about. You become transhuman by taking out parts of your DNA, replacing it with their DNA, and pretty soon, over time, and he even says this will be the last generation that dies. We're going to see people live forever based on their altered DNA. I mean, it's weird stuff. We'll look more of that when we get to chapter 13. But the be that as it may, it's all under the guise today. These guys are saying, oh, this will improve your health. And when you read about CRISPR, you know, you hear somebody's got weird cancer, and then they take out part of that DNA, they put it in this CRISPR in there. It sounds good on paper because they're seeing some good results, but it's going to go to this nth degree where they say this is for your health, this is for your environment. The one thing every one of them has in common with the World Health or the World Economic Forum is they all say we need to bring the world's population under a billion people. So how do you do that? Well, here's one way we're going to see God will take care of that. And maybe some of these yo-yos will be here when it happens. I think so. Well, look at verse 6. In those days men will seek death because of the torment of these scorpion-like, you know, weird critters, these locust creatures, these demons. They will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Uh, again, this is like your worst horror movie, Death Takes a Holiday. You know, for five months, people are going to literally, they'll try to blow their brains out. They won't die. They'll get on a 100-story building, jump. They'll be flat, waddle around, but they won't die. God won't allow their spirit to leave their body. That's what death is. Your spirit leaves your body. He's not going to let that happen. Their intent, these demons, is to steal, kill, and destroy. And so... They make so many things seem like innocent fun. And I think when this takes place, all these people are going to come face to face with all the demons that they've been maybe unknowingly following and worshiping. You know, people that have the attitude, oh, what's wrong with going to a fortune teller? What's wrong with playing and dabbling with tarot cards? What's wrong with playing with Ouija boards? Having a spirit guide, all these things, you know, sexual immorality, do what you want, how you want. Behind it are demons. It's very demonic. And during these judgments in chapter 9, God is pulling the spiritual veil off of people's eyes, and they're going to see the demonic realm for what it really is. So in God's grace, he's not letting them die, because if they die, they're lost for eternity. They've got seven months or five months to think about it. Well, I couldn't kill myself. Maybe there is a God. I mean, I don't know. Maybe some people will get saved out of this. Jesus says three times in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, it's the place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. God doesn't desire for people to perish. God wants people to repent of their sins and turn to him for salvation. 2 Peter 3, verse 9, it's very clear, where Peter writes, The Lord is not slack or slow concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering or patient toward us, not willing, not desiring that any should perish, but for all but that all should come to repentance. That's truly the heart of God toward all people. He loves us. He demonstrated his love toward us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
So don't think, oh, God's being a meanie here. No, he's given people every opportunity to get saved. Unfortunately, most people are not willing to turn away from their sins, and they will face this judgment from the Lord. Look at verse 7. Now put yourself in the Apostle John's sandals for a moment. He's up in heaven. He's watching these things take place. It says, the shape of the locust was like, and he uses that word like, it's hard to describe exactly what he's seeing. So he says, the shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. I mean, I love Hal Lindsey, but Hal Lindsey said, these are probably helicopters flying around and missiles coming out and you know doing all this damage. And then you read the next verse, they had hair like women's hair. I don't think I've seen any helicopters with women's hair coming off the bubble or whatever. Anyway, they they had teeth, were like lion's teeth. Again, this is all demonic stuff somehow coming into the natural realm. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. Back in 2020, they had one of the worst locust invasions of all time recorded over in Africa, in certain parts of Africa. Literally, they take out square miles of vegetation in a very short time. You can Google some of those, and I did, and just turn up your sound. I mean, the sound these things make is incredible. Just, I mean, you can't even hear over it when they're just so loud. So sounds like this, and it says... Verse 9, they had breastplates, like breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. Verse 10, they had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. Brutal, heavy duty. But again, these things are like this. Verse 11, and they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. Who's this? Whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon. Abaddon means destruction. But in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. Apollyon means destroyer. That's the name for Satan. Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. So I think that's who he's referring to. Their leader is Satan. John chapter 10, verse 10 Jesus says of him, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And that's all you really need to know about the difference between Jesus and Satan. Satan wants to destroy your life. Jesus wants to save your life. Very simple. It's a huge extreme Jesus came into this world to suffer and die in our place so that we might receive the love and forgiveness of God and then live with him forever and ever. But Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy you, period. Verse 12, one woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. This is why we're not going to talk about this on Christmas Sunday. <laughs> You know, I mean, this is brutal stuff. Verse 13, here's the second woe we'll look at. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. We saw back in chapter 8, when we get to heaven, heaven is the real deal. When God tells Moses, build the tabernacle, the tabernacle is a model of heaven. They had the altar of incense outside the Holy of Holies, and the the incense burning represented the prayers of the saints. The high priest would take that that coal into the Holy of Holies, wave it before the Lord, and it represented the prayers of the saints. In chapter 8, we saw this angel takes a coal from this altar, and it says it's the prayers of the saints before the Lord, and then he casts it to the earth. So here's the same scene here with this altar this golden altar, which is before God, and he hears a voice. And this is what we read in verse 14. Saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. And so that's the command with this sixth trumpet blast is that these four angels that have been bound by the great river Euphrates are let loose. 
Now, why would they be bound in this location? Well, it's in this area where they call it the cradle of civilization. In, in the book of Genesis, during creation, you see these four rivers that flow out of the Garden of Eden. Euphrates, Tigris are two of them. Gihon and the other one flow out of the Garden of Eden. After the flood, it's all rearranged, but you have Satan tempting Adam and Eve in that region. You have the first murder taking place in that region when Cain killed his brother Abel. You had the Tower of Babel built, Genesis 10, in that same region where God then confused all the languages and the people were scattered. On the river Euphrates, the great city of Babylon was built, and that became the cradle for every false teaching and doctrine in the world today. That's where it all started. You can trace back all the pagan ideas, all the you know unbiblical teachings back to Babylon. And so these four powerful demons probably had their hands in a lot of those things. God locked them away. But look at verse 15. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, and that literally means this is a specific time, the hour and the day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. And so at this very specific moment during the Great Tribulation, God allows these four demons to do what they do best, kill and destroy. And in a very short time, they kill one-third of the remaining population of the world. Back in chapter 6, verse 8, we saw when the, the fourth seal was open, third seal, um, a fourth of all the world's population was wiped out. And then so you got three quarters left. Now a third of that is wiped out. So just with those two judgments, half of the world's population is destroyed. This is the great tribulation. The world has never seen anything like this. It'll never see anything like this again. This is why Jesus says about the great tribulation, chapter uh, 24 of Matthew's gospel, verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, the Jews that are going to make it through the great tribulation, those days will be shortened. We're blessed to be part of the body of Christ I am so thankful that Jesus has a plan for us, and it does not include the Great Tribulation. Now look at verse 16. Now the number of the army of the horsemen, so these guys, these four fallen angels, they put together this army of the horsemen, it was 200 million. Many think that's how many of these locusts, you know, scorpion kind of critters there are. But 200 million. I heard the number of them, and thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, again like, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents having heads and with them they do harm. So what are these 200 million? I have no idea. I know in the book, uh, not in the book, in 1964, I think it was, Mao Zedong said that, um, Larry, okay? No? Okay. Let's pray for Larry. Father, we lift up Larry to you right now, and we just pray for your healing hand to be upon him. We ask that you would give him strength, that you give him peace in his heart and mind. Lord, that you would just be with him now, and, and just pray that you would uh, pour out your spirit upon him and Martha. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, 1964, 65, Mao Zedong, who was the premier of China at the time, says, oh, we can field an army of 200 million people. So some have said, oh, that's the 200 million 
Chinese are going to enter into this battle. Well, the Battle of Armageddon doesn't happen until chapter 16. These are some kind of demonic critters, 200 million of them. And whatever they're like, it says their, their tails are like serpents. Whatever John is seeing here must have blown his mind. Remember, the sixth trumpet judgment is an attack by these four very powerful demons. So this is spiritual warfare to the extreme. But again, all spiritual warfare eventually will spill out into the physical realm. What exactly is he seeing? I don't know, but it kills a third of all humans that are still on the earth at this time. It's not till the sixth bull judgment in chapter 16 that the Battle of Armageddon takes place. So we know that Battle of Armageddon, you know, includes all nations. This is just a, a different type of thing. So whatever it is, it's going to be gruesome. Well, look at verse 20. We'll wrap it up here. It says, but the rest of mankind, so the half of the population that isn't put to death at this moment, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. These are two of the saddest verses, I think, in the book of Revelation because you'd hope now half of the world's population is destroyed. You would hope the remaining people would say, we cry out to God in repentance. Lord, we know this is you because they know in chapter 6 this is the wrath of the Lamb. But here they don't repent. This is so sad. They're digging in their heels. They're not repenting of their idolatry, it says. They love their stuff more than they love God. They didn't repent of their murders. Their hearts are so hard, they don't have any problem killing one another. We're there today. It's like the days of Noah. Any given weekend, this weekend, I'm sure, look at the paper, look at the statistics tomorrow. Google how many people were shot in Chicago. Every weekend, it's like 20 to 40 people shot, 10 to 15 people killed every weekend in Chicago. That's like all over the world, especially in our country, in these big cities. People don't have any conscience. They're seared in their conscience. They don't have any problem killing other people. It says they don't repent of their sorceries here. The Greek word there is pharmakia, drugs, drinking. I mean, they would rather... And we've known people like this. We've reached out to people like this that have come to church here. And they won't turn from their sin. There's a guy, and you've probably seen him around, and he had a family, he had a good job, he's an electrician, and he says, I would rather drink than be with my family. And he's out here in the street. A lot of times he's out here on North Avenue 29 Road, passed out under a bush, We've tried to help him. He doesn't want it. It's so sad. He says, I would rather do this. It's like, come on, man. These things are destroying your life. Mind-altering drugs. They're used to contact demons. That's what, you know, pharmacia was, you know, originally part of pharmacia was to contact the other spiritual realm. He says they're not repenting of their sexual immorality. God designed sex between a husband and wife, period. Not between others that aren't your wife or your spouse, your husband. Gayness, it's not gay, it's sin. Transgender, it's sin. There's demons behind all these things. And it's so sad. Don't take my word for it. Here's a good assignment. Read Leviticus 18. And then you see God's response and his judgment in Leviticus chapter 20. Well, it's a fun read before bed. Leviticus 18, he'll describe every sick, sick, sick sexual sin out there. Bestiality, incest, he goes through it all. He doesn't hold anything back. And God's very clear, this is sin. I created a man and a woman to be together in marriage. That's the only place that sex is allowed by God. He made the rules, not me. Don't think I'm a prude. God's the one that says this is his design. 
It's so sad when people say, no, maybe God's word says that, but I'm going to do this. I guess he doesn't care. You know, all these things here, thefts, we see this all the time. You know, people go out to L.A., man, you can just go into a jewelry store in L.A. as long as you don't take over 900 bucks. You're free to go bust something, take it out with you, go to Target, steal what you want. As long as it doesn't add up to 900 bucks, you're good. These guys are going in and out, in and out, arrested 30 times. They get out 30 times. They keep doing it. Why? Because there's no consequences. There are consequences. God's the final judge. Jesus says, all judgment is to be turned over to me. And all these things, as you go through this, it just proves that the hearts of men and women are empty. God created us to know him. God created us to worship him. He wants to have a relationship with us, but Satan has placed all these different obstacles in our path to distract us, to keep us from knowing the truth of who Jesus is, of why he came from heaven to earth. But all those who practice these things, they also prove their heart is empty and they are thirsty. Thirsty for something to find an answer for something, but it's never going to satisfy. You're only going to be satisfied in Jesus. This is why Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. He says, all who come to me, I'll by no means cast out. One of the final promises in God's word, and I'll end with this. It's Revelation 22, verse 17. It says, in the spirit and the bride, that's you and me, saying to the people of this world, come, let him who hears say, come, let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Jesus has the free gift of eternal life for anyone, for all who will come to him by faith. Period. Period.